Only the Father knows. The world will be at ease, banquets and parties and weddings, just as it was in Noah's time before the sudden coming of the flood. People wouldn't believe what was going to happen until the flood actually arrived and took them all away. So shall my coming be. Two men will be working together in the fields, and one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be going about their household tasks. One will be taken, the other left. So be prepared, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold, a piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind, the sun has come, you've been left behind. A man and wife are sleeping there, she hears a noise and turns her head and he's gone. A scripture that reverberates in my temple has been for about six months now. I'll never forget that day. I was down at my parents' place and I was reading Romans and that one stood out. It absolutely stood out for the first time. You know when you read scriptures and you can read it over and over and then bam. Because of, because of what you're praying about, where the Holy Spirit's leading you, your last read of the scriptures, what's happening in your life, all of a sudden you read that scripture and it goes, okay, okay, so something's just changed. So I mentioned there in my last video, my fig tree video, my Revelation 6.13 fig tree video, that something that I really pray hard about at the moment is why did the Lord give down the law to a nation that's blessed only to, to be told later that to serve that thing, no, that's not the way you go about it. We go about it a, we go about it a different way. Now, I'll do this first. So as I start, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep going with my Giants videos today, but I just want to share a, just want to share a couple of things. First of all, and I want to do a quick recap of just what I'm doing on these Giants videos. So as, as I start out on this video, I am up to Mark. Oh, open it up. There we go. Right there. Mark 15. So just a couple of chapters left to go in Mark. But I... As I read through the New Testament this time, I'm absolutely looking for this and I really feel as though the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's really showing me a couple of things here. Just a scripture that I read, it was yesterday, day before in Matthew 23. So Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 23 is off the long run. He's giving it to the Pharisees. He's just gun barrel into their eyes saying, you hypocrites you hypocrites that's I, I it's coming into me now that the, the washing of the hands parable means that you don't so when you sit down and you eat with somebody you break bread with somebody you that that, that that's starting to seem to me that you're talking the truth you're talking about the lord jesus christ you're talking about the truth so the Pharisees refused to sit down with the heathen and talk about the truth because they're unclean. 
So that's, I'm sort of seeing now that that's what unwashing hands might mean. So when they sit down and eat with somebody, they, they don't do it with sinners because they think, and they're hypocrites because they're sinning the whole time. They're sitting the whole time, but to eat with unwashing hands, that for me now means that they're they're basically sitting there and they're and they're eating and they're talking about God, they're talking about the truth. They're doing that, they're doing that with sinners. But the thing is with the Pharisees, they're not even trying to keep the law. Because they're 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 cleaning, they're cleaning, they're washing the outside of their temple, but the inside is just dirty, it's it's defiled. It's unclean, right? Matthew twenty three twenty three. I read this, and this is what I mean. This is what I mean. At the all the times I've read these scriptures, and this one just just two days ago, this just stood out, and I went, oh, okay, okay. So things have just changed, and it's really given me some context into into Hebrews Hebrews uh, four one and two. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. And what are they? Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, not to leave the other undone. So I read that and I thought, okay. So on the earth today, three things, three things that are sorely missing on the earth today are judgment, something that I've been fighting my whole life, judgment and justice mercy and faith so those two go hand in hand and the lord jesus christ here is telling the pharisees that they're not doing those things but the weightier matters of the law so these things are in the law so i can't wait to get to the old testament again right because we've got judgment i've seen that in the law mercy i haven't seen that and faith I don't think I've seen that in the law. So I'm really looking forward to getting to the Old Testament again. But here we go, right? So the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us what by telling the Pharisees that judgment, mercy and faith, right? Faith is a part of the law. So I read that and it absolutely blew my mind. And I thought, okay. It's just changed, and I feel as though something new has come in. It might just seem totally inconsequential to others, but for me that was that was huge because something that's coming into me now with the Holy Spirit, and it has been for quite some time, is he wants us to ask him why. Why? He doesn't want us just to follow a set of rules because they're rules. I know this because that's how he created me. I've always had a problem with authority. When I was little, when I was a little boy, I was always in trouble because I was rebelling. I was always on detention at school because I hate rules. I've never understood why it has to be a rule that, that they've got the right that when the, when the man is read that you can't cross the street. It's like, why do we need that? Why do we need that, right? And, 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 and. So quick testimony, I was I was having coffee yesterday, it was yesterday with, with mum. Today's the 29th of August at around about midday. So I was talking to mum and we were having coffee there yesterday and something that's a real bugbear for me, something I can't stand is people walking on the right. I can't stand it, it incenses me, it always has. And when I go for my walk, it's a, it's a proper walkway up here and people walk on the left because here in Australia, we drive on the left. So you walk on the left. So when I was in the Philippines, everybody walked on the right. So when I was there, I walked on the right. It's just, it's not a rule, right? And I said, it's not a rule, but it's just courtesy. And it's the way you keep order in society. And I said to mum, I said, why is it that people needs for something to be a rule in order for them to do it. Because you have people, even on this walkway, they just walk on the right. It's like, why is this hard? Why is this so difficult to walk on the on the left? And why do you need... It's always irritated me, this. It's a funny old thing, right? Why do you need rules and guidelines for you to do it? And I... And, as I said it, as I said it, I thought, well, here we go. Because people, they're just following. I've done it my whole life. You just follow the rules. You follow the laws 
because they're rules and they're laws. You just do it, right? You don't question. I've always questioned a lot of things, but most of these rules, you just follow the rule. Why? Because they're a rule. And that's what people are doing on the earth today. They're wearing face masks because the government's telling them there's a killer virus on the loose when, when there isn't. People are standing six feet away from each other because the government said now it's a rule. They're not asking why. They're not seeing any evidence as to why they should be doing it, but they're just doing it. Why? Because the government's told them it's a rule. And they're limiting how many, they're, they're self-regulating on the street. People are self-regulating the rules. So you go to a shop, only five people are allowed in this shop. So people are counting. I've seen them do it. They count. Oh, I can't go in there because the sign says, the rule says that only five can go in. For me, I'm just like, well, just go in. And you make them, you make them impose the rules on you. But people are self-regulate. And it's like, so people will self-regulate nonsensical rules and laws, but when it comes to looking after themselves, this is where this whole safety thing comes in, people can't keep themselves safe. They need the government to keep them safe, right? And that's why they're all falling prey to this thing. So on, when it comes to something like most people are good, most people will just walk on the, on the left, right? But you've got some who don't. Now, for me, when I said that, I thought, so say that's a law. So say that's a law of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That, that's a law that's in, that's in, that's in Numbers and, and Leviticus, right? Thou shalt walk on the left. So what I'm getting from this now is that if you walk on the left, because the law says you walk on the left, well, then you're a slave to the law. But if you're walking on the left because you know it's just and you know it's the will of the Lord because it makes sense, it's logical, and it's everything that's good, and the reason why you know these things is because you've got faith in Jesus, well, then you're not, you don't need the law, right? So I, when I go out, and when, when most fair-minded people go out and do things, you don't need a law to say not to do it. You just logic, your logic tells you not to do it. And I think that's what might be going on here. I think that's what might be going on here with the law, with the law and the gospel, right? Because Jesus said it. The weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. So they're in the law. Those things are in the law. And for me, this is what Paul's talking about. By faith, you, Jesus manifests himself to you more. You start to understand these things more. And you, because you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ because you want the truth and you want to be just and you want to be righteous in his name, you start to fulfill the law without even knowing what it is. Is walking on the left in the law? I don't know, right? I just do it because I've got faith in Jesus because it's just. It's reasonable. It's not. It, it it makes sense. That's that's where I'm at. It's a little thing, but I really feel as though I've etched a little bit closer now. And these Pharisees, that's what makes them hypocrites. That's what makes them hypocrites is that they're telling to everyone else that they have to do these things and they're standing up there in their long robes and everybody's going, Rabbi, Rabbi, how wonderful are you? And they've got a million subscribers on, on YouTube and inward they're dirty and they're defiled and they're unclean. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going, you hypocrites, you don't even believe it's me. I've been telling you and telling you and telling you that I'm coming and you don't even believe me. You don't even believe I'm coming. And that's why all of these people on the street, he healed their blindness and he healed their sick, healed their sickness because, because they had faith in him. They had faith in who he was and what he could do and in the scriptures. So it's been a big thing. And now I'm also seeing this leads me to this whole affliction thing, right? Affliction. And I, I, I see when the Lord Jesus Christ, when he heals sin, He's healing affliction. They, it, 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 they, there's, a, there's a story there where somebody's got the, he's got leprosy or it might be the story of the palsy. It's one, I'll put it up on screen where he says it directly. Your sins are forgiven as he heals that person of their physical affliction. And I'm also starting to see 
that sin manifests as debt, as debt. When you see debt, pay the debt, that means they're forgiving sin. So now, now these children of Israel in the Old Testament, it's very, very profound some of the things that they could or couldn't do. Like I'm seeing these earthen vessels, for instance, right? I'm seeing these earthen vessels where, what are they? What What's an earthen vessel? You see it in Leviticus 6 and Leviticus 11. I'll put it up on screen. What are they? What's an earthen vessel? And, 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 and Paul says it directly that that's what it is in the New Testament. These things that we live in are earthen vessels. And the Lord God tells Jeremiah to go to the potter's house and get an earthen bottle and take it to the valley of the sun of Hinnom and break it. So that tells me that we've got a third party. We've got Jeremiah, we've got the Lord, and we've got the potter's house. Otherwise, the Lord would be saying, go there. He'd be saying, come to me, come to my house and get the, get the potter's bottle. So what are they doing? So the children of Israel... I'm being led to think we're sending their seed through the fire to Molech, right? They're sending their seed through the fire to Molech, God's seed. So what were they meant to be doing with it? Because as they did that, I'm being led to think that they're making giants. So what, what is it they were supposed to be doing with God's seed where they were, they were making giants with it? And we see these giants ruling the world today in, in the name of evil. What were the children of Israel meant to be doing with it? So Jeremiah... He has the ability to go to the potter's house and get one of these earthen bottles and to go to the Valley of the Sun of Hinnom and break one. So just who are these people? Who are these children of Israel? And what is it they were meant to be doing in the land of Canaan, the land of rest, the land of the Lord Jesus Christ? What is it they were supposed to be doing in that land with God's seed. Scriptures are absolutely leading me to think that in Genesis 2, the man was created to till the ground and that's exactly what the children of Israel went into the land of Canaan to do. So in Scripture, somebody knew how to make giants because we know there was giants in Genesis 6 before the flood. And we also know there was a remnant of giants in Deuteronomy and Numbers because the scriptures say they went up to fight them. So there was giants in the land of Canaan when the children of Israel went in. So this is a big problem. That What's a giant, right? I'm being absolutely led to think that that's where we are. You can see by the photos I've got up on the screen now that these monsters running the world today... They're giants, and that's why they seem to have no conscience. That's why they seem weak and flaccid and feeble and devoid of plant and animal life, just like what we read for the explanation of Rafa, but they're not devoid of powers of memory and such and such brain activity. That's that's who we're seeing today. That's why they can do all this. That's what that's it's it's not a question of how can they live with themselves and they sell their soul. No, they're, they're not of God. They're, they're these giants. They're these giants that we read about in the scriptures. So it was a problem. And in Leviticus 18, we read that the Canaanites committed all the sins that the Lord God was telling the Israelites not to commit. And one of those was sending your seed through the fire to Molech, which is leading me to think where they were making giants in the valley of the son of Hinnom. They, they make an altar to Baal, and by doing that, they let their seed and their sons and their daughters pass through the fire to Molech. Thus, they make giants. So somebody's got the ability to make giants, and it seems to me that the children of Israel left the land of Canaan in the same state that they found it, and that's why the Lord God cast them out. So somebody's got the ability to make these giants. Are we? I can't see anybody today that can do that. We've got the Lord giving down commandment in Leviticus to the children of Israel about 
earthen vessels. Paul is saying that the church of Corinth are in earthen vessels. The Lord is telling Jeremiah to go to the very place where they make giants with a potter's earthen bottle and go to the valley of the son of Hinnom and break that potter's earthen bottle. And then in Romans 9, we read this, verse 21. I'll pick it up at 20. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay, or the same lump, to make one vessel unto an honour, and another unto dishonour? So that's telling me that the God that God's the potter. God's the potter, and this is a parable, this is a metaphor for people. God makes people, and people are the clay, and people are a vessel. So then when we read in Leviticus 6 and 11 about earthen vessels, what are the children of Israel supposed to be doing? What are these earthen vessels? And who is the potter? Who is the potter in Jeremiah 18 and 19? We know the potter's the Lord. So why is the Lord telling Jeremiah to go somewhere else and take one of these earthen bottles, these earthen bottles of clay from the potter's house and go to the very scene, the valley of the son of Hinnom, where they were making giants? It seems to me that the children of Israel have got an incredible ability and a massive responsibility to do things just like the Canaanites, but instead they made giants. So I'm being led to think that they had the ability to make giants and they chose to use their blessing to defile the Lord God and his seed and his blessing to make giants. So instead of making giants, what were they supposed to be doing? They weren't just going into a land and planting vineyards and drinking wine, like in the literal sense. They had the ability to make giants. Somebody has the ability to make giants now. Somebody had the ability to make giants in Deuteronomy before the, before the children of Israel went in. And somebody had the ability to make giants in Genesis 6. It's Satan, absolutely, but how does it happen? How does Satan actually do these things? And why is the Lord God giving commandment to the children of Israel about earthen vessels and Paul t tells the Corinthians that they're dwelling in earthen vessels. And for me, the Corinthians are people. And in Romans 9, we've got Paul telling the Romans about the potter having power over the clay and, and, and vessels. And it seems to me, he's, he's, that's what this says. It's a, to me, this is a, a metaphor, a parable about the creation, about God and, and and people, and a vessel's a person. So people are clay, and people are a vessel. And we've got Paul also talking about the Corinthians dwelling in vessels. When we're in the Old Testament, we've got the children of Israel, the Lord God commanding the children of Israel about what to do in earthen bottles. So what is it they were meant to be doing? What is it they were actually meant to be doing? Now, this, I'm thinking what I might do. I'm, I'm thinking I, I, I've just, this, is, this sort of reminds me of my old car videos too. To, I used to love doing those videos. I just sit there and just talk because I've got no one to talk to. So I think I'm going to divert from my Giants videos again. I've just got so much to say, so much to talk about, so much coming in. And I just want to, I just want to get these things down. I just want to talk and I just want to get these things down and, these things are on my heart and something that I'm absolutely learning with the Lord Jesus Christ if, is you just be brave in his name. The more you search for him, the more you the more you want him, the more you sacrifice for him, the more 
you allow him to become your life, to control your life, the more he's going to manifest himself to you and the more he's going to show you in the scriptures. So I just need to keep being brave. So I ask every day, I pray every day for for rebukes if I'm not in truth, but boy, do I want confirmations and if I am in truth. But I just, for me, as I go on and on, it just seems it's right in front of our faces that giants run the world. We live in a world today that are run by giants who are not like us. We are creations of God. We are mankind and they are not. They're not. You look at the Bill Gates, for instance, and that people say they're transgender. To me, they're not. They're nothing. They're, they're abominations. They're both. They're Baphomet. They're, they're what's the word, androgynous. They're, they're androgynous. So they have to present as one gender. So they look weird. But then you've got others who seem to be beautiful. They appear physically beautiful. Others look hideous. Some look physically beautiful. It's all very, very strange. It's all very strange. But they, the children of Israel, to me, they had the ability, and not only the ability, they were being commanded about earthen bond. I'll put it this way. The way I'm seeing it is that the children of Israel were being commanded about what to do with earthen vessels. You've got... Jer and you've got Paul in the New Testament referring to earthen vessels directly as people. And in Jeremiah 18, 19, you've got the Lord God commanding Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house and go to the very scene with one of those earth potter's earthen bottles and go to the very scene where they were making giants when they should have been doing what? What should they have been doing instead? Jeremiah's got the ability to go and get one of these earthen bottles and take it to the Valley of the Son of Hinnom where they were making giants. So I think you can see where I'm going. And as I say in my previous few videos, it's just getting weirder and weirder. It's just getting stranger and stranger. It's really hard some days to reconcile this, but I've just got to keep going. Because as I do keep going, I get I get rebukes, but I'm, I'm getting a lot of confirmations from the Holy Spirit in Scripture. I'm hungry, man. Are you hungry? I'm hungry. I want this so bad, and I just want to... It's my whole life now. It's my whole life now. Everything I do, I have to go to the Lord Jesus Christ about how I conducted myself, the decisions I made, every little thing now. You can't lie. You just cannot lie at all because if you lie, it's not it's not allowing the Holy Spirit to work and the Holy Spirit can't manifest himself to you because the Holy Spirit don't like sin. For whatever reason, we're here in this sinful realm in a state that seems to be a sin just to exist. But the Lord God, the Holy Father, he doesn't respond to sin. He doesn't respond to sin. So we've got to let the Lord Jesus Christ manifest himself to us so we can understand what a sin is and how we navigate our way in this world. It's amazing what's coming in at the moment. I'm just, I'm so hungry for this and I just feel as though the hungrier I get and the further I go on with this, the more the Holy Spirit's revealing himself to me. It's glorious. It's wonderful. It's, I'm finding I can have better conversations now. I'm not getting frustrated with people. I just let them go. I just let them talk. And if the Holy Spirit leads me, I get led, you know. So in Matthew 17, we've got the Lord Jesus Christ. He was transfigured before three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John. And he was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now in Exodus 34, we read a very similar scene with Moses. So remember Moses and Elijah have appeared with the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord Jesus Christ is transfigured before them, they're appearing to the three disciples. 
them being Elijah and Moses. Now, in Exodus, Moses, when he went up and he went and communed with the Lord, right, for 40 days and 40 nights. Here we go with this 40 days and 40 nights again. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh unto him. And Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off. Because the children of Israel, when they saw the face of Moses, the skin of Moses' face did shine. And Moses put the veil upon his face. So Moses has to put the veil upon his face because the skin of his face shone when he communed with the Lord. So when he communed with the children of Israel, he had to put the veil upon his face again because the children of Israel, they couldn't look at him because he's the skin of his face shone. And in Matthew 17, we've got the Lord Jesus Christ. His face did shine as the sun. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses, whose face did shine as the sun in Exodus and Elijah. Now, Elijah and Enoch are the only two figures in all of Scripture who didn't see death. They went up to the Lord before they died, Elijah and Enoch. Now, we read about when it happens to Elijah in 2 Kings 2. Now, Elijah, very interestingly to note, that Elisha, who took the mantle from Elijah after Elijah went up to heaven in the whirlwind, when Elisha saw it, he said, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, right? So Elisha's calling Elijah, who's just went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And this has led me to think, absolutely led me to think that Elijah's John the Baptist because the Lord Jesus Christ said it. And I'll get to that in just a sec. But Elisha, who took the mantle from Elijah, is describing Elijah as not only a chariot, but the chariot of Israel. Now, chariots are what the horsemen ride, the celestial host. The, the horsemen ride in the chariot when they go warring in the heavenly spiritual wars. And Elijah is the chariot He's the chariot of Israel. And in Isaiah 40, we read Isaiah tell us about John the Baptist, because John the Baptist is Elijah. Because the Lord Jesus Christ tells us that in the scriptures that we're looking at at the moment in Matthew 17. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already. And they knew him not but have done unto him whatsoever they listed, likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. So by the Lord Jesus Christ telling us that, that, that Elijah's already come, the disciples understood. So this is scripture. This, this is telling me that the disciples now saw this as the truth. That the Lord Jesus Christ has just given them the truth about Elijah being John the Baptist. So in Matthew 17, the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us directly that Elijah is John the Baptist. So when we read in Isaiah 40 and verse 3 about the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert, right? I want to get to this word desert, a highway for our God. When we read this, we know that this is about John the Baptist, and we know that John the Baptist is Elijah, because the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us. But we know that this prophecy is all about John the Baptist, because we read about this a few times in the New Testament, not least of all in Matthew 11, where the Lord Jesus Christ talks about it. Now, there's a bit of a twist with this. John the Baptist is mentioned in all four of the gospel books, but there's a bit of a twist in the book of John that I'm going to get to as this, as this video progresses. But in Matthew 11, 10 and 11, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us, For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So we know 
that this is a fulfillment of this prophecy in Isaiah 40 and verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. So this is what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about in Matthew 11 verse 10. And then in verse 11, he tells us that it is about John the Baptist. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us that the prophecy that we read in Isaiah 40 and verse 3, he's talking about that prophecy in Matthew 11, and that prophecy is about John the Baptist, and we know that John the Baptist is Elijah, because the Lord Jesus Christ has told us. After Elijah, who's the chariot, right, who's the chariot of Israel, has been taken up by a whirlwind into heaven, right? So we've got Elijah, who's the chariot of Israel. He's now in heaven. John the Baptist. So in Isaiah 40 verse 3, we're reading about Elijah, John the Baptist, who's now, who's now in heaven, because it tells us that that happened to him in 2 Kings 2. And in Matthew 17... We've got the Lord Jesus Christ telling us that Elijah's come already. Elijah being John the Baptist. So the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness is both John the Baptist and Elijah. They're the same being, the highway, this word highway, because he's in the celestial, right? He's in heaven. This word highway, well, yes, it's the same Hebrew word as the stars fought in their courses, they fought against Caesarea. So the star course. The stars fought in their star courses against Caesarea. And now we've got Elijah, John the Baptist. Well, he's preparing a star course for the Lord Jesus Christ to come to the earth. And it's also very interesting to know that this word courses for the stars fought in their courses against Caesarea and the celestial highway that Elijah, John the Baptist is going to make for the Lord Jesus Christ it also gives a staircase in the Strong's definition, and this immediately takes me to Jacob's ladder. A ladder, a staircase. I don't know. For me, that just stands out. And also, Solomon's temple, there were six steps that went up to the house of the Lord. Six steps, right, on a staircase. And they talk now about that Led Zeppelin song, right? The stairway to heaven. And this word... Stars fought in their courses against Caesarea. The stars in their courses against Caesarea also means staircase. And we've got Elijah, John the Baptist, in the celestial. He's making a highway, potentially a staircase for our God, because that's where the Lord Jesus Christ is, right? He's in the celestial. He is with God because he is God. And now, is this is this what they talk about on the earth today, this stairway to heaven? I, I'm not sure. But in any case, we've got Elijah. He's the chariot of Israel, and he's been taken by a whirlwind up into heaven, Elijah. We've got the Lord Jesus Christ telling the disciples that Elijah's come already. And when he said these things, the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. So Elijah is... John the Baptist, and he, John the Baptist, Elijah, well, now he's in the heavens, he's in the celestial with God after being taken up by that whirlwind, well, he's making a celestial star course for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Matthew 11, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us more about John the Baptist, for this is he, of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger, right, messenger, before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ talking about Elijah, John the Baptist, who's in heaven after being taken up in a whirlwind, the chariot of Israel, the celestial chariot of Israel. He's been, he's been taken up by a whirlwind into the heaven, and he is making a celestial star course for our God. And the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 11 is telling us about John the Baptist, I send my messenger before thy face. So this is a fulfillment of the Isaiah 40 verse 3 prophecy about John the Baptist 
and Elijah, the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us. But this word messenger, right? So Elijah is in heaven and he's making a celestial star course for the Lord Jesus Christ to come to earth. And the Lord Jesus Christ is now telling us that he is the Lord Jesus Christ's messenger. Now that word messenger is G32 and it's translated out as angel, right? Angel and messenger. Elijah, the chariot of Israel, who was taken up into a whirlwind and then he's in the heavens, he's in the celestial and he's making a celestial star course for our God. And now we've got the Lord Jesus Christ referring to him as a messenger and that word for messenger g32 is angel messenger a messenger envoy one who is sent an angel a messenger from god and we come down into matthew 11 10 and there it is there and the previous time we read g32 is when the angels minister to the lord jesus christ after satan leaves him after his 40 days here we go 40 days 40 nights again after his 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. I'm going to get to this word wilderness in just a sec. But the angels, G32, came and ministered to him. And the Lord Jesus Christ is describing John the Baptist, Elijah, the chariot of Israel, as a messenger. Same Greek word as angel. Now, in Luke 1, we read about the mother and the father of John the Baptist, Zacharias and Elizabeth. Now, this is fascinating for me on a few levels because we've got the course, right? We've got the course of Abia. So they're Levites. Zacharias is a Levite. And in Malachi 2, we read all about the priest, the priest being of Levi, right? So the priests come from the tribe of Levi. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they shall seek the Lord at his mouth. For he is the, look at this, messenger of who? The messenger of the Lord of the spiritual bodies. H6635, celestial bodies. So the priests who are of Levi, they are the messenger of, of the Lord of the celestial bodies. Now that word for messenger in the Old Testament, it happens again. H4397, we see it means both messenger and angel. And we come down into the scripture in Malachi 2.7 where we read about the Levites, the priests, being the messenger of the Lord of the celestial bodies. And in the previous time we see H4397, well, we see it as angel, don't we? So it happens again in the Old Testament. And we've got the Levites of whom John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, well, he is one. And he's of, of the course, right? The stars fought in their courses against Caesarea. But check this out. And they were both righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless, right? So, But these two people, they are righteous before God and they are blameless. They're righteous and blameless, right? Now, in Matthew 9, we read about the Lord Jesus Christ healing somebody of their palsy and he departs to their house. I want to get back to these scriptures, God willing, in this video. I want to look at these scriptures in a little bit more detail. But we read the Lord Jesus Christ, he departs into this man's house. Now, when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Now, when I read the, the Pharisees' reactions to things, the Pharisees are tempting the Lord Jesus Christ. Where I'm being led to think is that the Pharisees are tempting the Lord Jesus Christ with the law. So the, the Pharisees are, they're talking about the law to Jesus. Why are you doing these things? It's against the law. Now they can't, they, they're they being hypocrites because they're not doing that themselves. But I'm being led to think that when the Pharisees challenge Jesus, what they're challenging him on was potentially a sin of the children of Israel under the law in the Old Testament. So in this case, we've got the Lord Jesus Christ. He's eating with publicans and sinners. So this is leading me to think in the Old Testament that the children of Israel couldn't do this. 
this is potentially is what I want to get to on this video as well, the distinction between clean and unclean. But I want to get to more of this in, in this video, God willing. And when the Pharisees, so when I see this, this I'm seeing this now as an Old Testament sin, and that's why the Pharisees are tempting the Lord Jesus Christ with it. When the Pharisees saw it, he said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Right? The unclean. Un, he's eating with unwashing hands. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. So I read that and I think, okay, so who's the physician? The physician's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The, the physician's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've got the Pharisees, that they're saying to Jesus, why are you doing this? And Jesus' response is, well, these, these people need the physician. They need me because they're sick, right? Sick meaning that they're sinners. So this, this to me in verse 12, is the Lord Jesus Christ saying, that there are people that are whole that don't need the physician, the physician being him. There's no one on the earth today, is there? There's no one on the earth today who doesn't need the physician that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone does because everybody's in a fallen state. But when we come back to Luke 1, well, we've got the mother and father of John the Baptist. They're both righteous before God. Walking in all, right? In all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So we come back to Matthew 8, and is this not who the Lord Jesus Christ who's referring to in verse 12? They that be whole, I want to get to this word whole as well, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Because if you're whole... That would make you holy, would it not? Would it not? So much I want to get to. Uh, so much I want to get to at the moment. I've got so much coming in, so much I want to talk about. I want to get back to my Giants videos. There's just so much, so much at the moment. But the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us here that not everybody needs a physician. And that's pretty much how John the Baptist, mother and father, is being described as both being righteous, walking in all the commandments and ordinances. So are they not fulfilling the law? And because they're fulfilling the law, they're blameless. And because they're blameless, well, they don't need the physician because they're not sick. That's where this is absolutely leading me to think at the moment. And that's what I say, that it's strange. Everything just at the moment seems strange. Like the stuff coming in and... I don't want it to be strange. I just want to know what the truth is. I've got no desire for the truth to be strange. I just want to know what it is. But to me, these two scriptures absolutely talk to each other because there has to be, there has to be people now who don't need a physician, the physician being the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're getting to, we're getting to in Luke 1, the mother and father of John the Baptist. These two are being described as two who don't need a physician, but yet on the earth today, we've got nobody, nobody who doesn't need the Lord Jesus Christ. And if anybody claims that they don't, well, to me, that's blasphemy in the highest because they're putting themselves on equal with God, aren't they? Because they don't need God and they can do it all on their own. And that's what these wicked giants running the world are doing. So there's more to put, there's more at play here. And this is, this is this is what I want to this is what I'm trying to talk about on this video is just who are who are these children of Israel and where were they and what were they meant to be doing if they if they, if they were making giants with God's seed what were they meant to be doing with it and these connections we've got to earthen bottles and to earthen vessels just directly being referred to as people in the New Testament. You know, it's just that scripture in 2 Corinthians where the veil, that the New Testament is the veil that's ripped off the Old Testament, you know, and it's just like, 
I don't know. You just got to keep being brave, right? Just got to keep being brave. But in any case, in Luke one seventeen, we read, and he shall go. So we're talking here about John the Baptist. We're talking about John the Baptist, Elijah, right? The Lord Jesus Christ has told us in Matthew 17 that Elijah is John the Baptist. So we've got Elijah, John the Baptist here, being described as going in the spirit, right? He's going in the spirit and power of Elijah, John the Baptist, of whom we're, we're reading about here, his parents being both righteous and blameless, walking in all the commandments of the Lord, blameless, seemingly not needing the physician. And now we're reading that John the Baptist is going to go in the spirit of the chariot of Israel, right? The chariot of Israel and Elijah, John the Baptist, has made the celestial star course in heaven after he was taken up to heaven. To me, to me, all of this just connects. I'm just being led by scripture and all of these things connect, right? But in verse 80, we read something very interesting. And the child grew. So we're still reading about John the Baptist, right? And the child grew and waxed strong in what? He waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of the showing unto Israel. So we've got John the Baptist going in the spirit of Elijah, the chariot of Israel. John the Baptist being a messenger, same Greek word as angel. He's waxing strong in the spirit and he was in the desert, right? He was in the desert until the day of his showing unto Israel. And in Isaiah 43, where we read about the prophecy of these things, Elijah, the chariot of Israel, John the Baptist, he's in the wilderness, right? He's in the wilderness, he's in heaven. He's been taken up by heaven by a whirlwind, so he's in the celestial wilderness, and he's preparing a celestial star course for the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, in Luke 180, we've got... John the Baptist, Elijah, the chariot of Israel, the messenger, same Greek word as angel, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's waxing strong in spirit and was in the desert. Could that be the wilderness? Till the day of his showing unto Israel. So is he in here? Is the desert, is this, is this the celestial wilderness that we read in Isaiah 40? Verse 3, I know, I know, it all seems strange, it all seems strange, but th th this is where the scriptures are leading me, so we come now, and it's, I'm just being led by scripture, right, so we come now into that word for desert that we read in, jo in, in Luke 180, G2048, and it's also translated out as wilderness. It's also translated out as wilderness. So now when we look in the New Testament at each time, the Greek text is translated out to wilderness. I ask you, because these are the questions I ask of the Holy Spirit every day, right? I ask you, each time we see this word wilderness, are we on earth or are we in the celestial or is it a mixture of both? For instance, in Matthew 4, when Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So was this taking place in heaven or was this taking place on earth? Was the devil in heaven or was the devil on earth when these things took place? And in Matthew 15, where the Lord Jesus Christ is performing the miracle with the bread, they're doing so in the wilderness. So where's this taking place? Is this taking place on earth or is this taking place in heaven? And in John 6, where the Lord Jesus Christ is telling the Jews, the chief scribes and the Pharisees, that their fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. Is this a earthly wilderness? Or was this a celestial wilderness? And on it goes, right? On it goes. We've got when the Lord God 
appeared to Moses in the wilderness by the burning bush? These are the questions, and it's not comfortable. It gets it gets very uncomfortable, this, but as I always say, all I want, all I want is the truth. And we see here in these scriptures about taking the tabernacle of, of Molech, their God, the star of Renthayen. And God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of prophets, O ye house of Israel, have you offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years, 40 years in the wilderness. So when they wandered the wilderness, were they wandering an earthly wilderness or were they wandering a celestial wilderness? Because when we keep going with this word, we come into the last five in the New Testament. We get it again in Hebrews. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. And we get it in verse 17 again where we're talking about the rest of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in Revelation 12, right? So Revelation 12 starts about the celestial. There was a wonder in heaven, right? And we've got the sun, Jacob, the moon, and I'm getting this from Genesis 37 with, with Joseph's dream. The moon, Rachel, and the 12 brothers, the 12 sons being the 12 stars, and the woman. So the woman was clothed with the sun, the moon, and the 12 stars, right? And she fled into the wilderness. So are we talking about a heavenly wilderness? Are we talking about an earthly wilderness? And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness in her place. And in Revelation 17, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So is this woman that we read about in Revelation 17, 3, this woman that was led by the Spirit in the wilderness that sat upon a scarlet-coloured beast full of names of blasphemy and having seven heads and ten horns, well, is this woman in the earth or is she in heaven? Is this an earthly wilderness or is this a celestial wilderness? As I say... All I want is the truth, and I'm not going to let any man scare me out of seeking it. But I think, at the very least, with the way the Scriptures are leading me to think right now, that it's at least indeed possible that some of these Scriptures where we read the word wilderness, some, maybe even all, are talking about a celestial wilderness because it just seems quite apparent to me that John the Baptist... Elijah, he was the one who was crying in the wilderness. And we read in 2 Kings 2 that he, before those things, was carried up by a whirlwind into heaven. So he was there. That's where he was. He was in the celestial wilderness. Now, a little earlier, I alluded to the story of John the Baptist and how it's recounted, the, the prophecy in Isaiah 40, verse 3, how it's recounted in the New Testament. Something that I've noticed is that all but one of these accounts, it's not John the Baptist talking, it's somebody else talking. So when we read it in Matthew 3, it's the author of Matthew speaking. It's not, He's not quoting anybody, it's not anybody talking, it's just him writing the scriptures. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching the wilderness of Judea, right? So there's no one talking. And saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that's what John the Baptist was saying. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Elijah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment. So this is not this is not a quote of what John the Baptist says. This is the author of Matthew telling us what happened and it's the same in Matthew 11 where we read about the Lord Jesus Christ talking about John the Baptist this is not John the Baptist talking about himself this is the Lord Jesus Christ talking about John the Baptist being the messenger the voice of him crying in the wilderness and in Mark 1 we read it again the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the son of God as it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. So it's not John the Baptist talking. It's the author of Mark who is telling us 
of the events. And we read about it in Luke 3, where in verse 2, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of him crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now this one, this one could could go either way. This could be John the Baptist talking, or I'm being led to think that this is Luke again. This is Luke recounting the events, just like what we read in Matthew and in Mark. Because it says in verse 7, Then he said to the multitude that come forth to be baptized of, of him. So this is the first time in this chapter where we read that John actually says something. So I'm being led to think up until verse 7, this is Luke recounting the events, just like what we read in Matthew and Mark. But from verse 7, we're talking about what John the Baptist actually said. But when we read the story again in the book of John, in John 1, it's quite different. It's quite different what we read, and it's quite profound. In verse 6, there was a man sent, right? There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. This was not that light, but was sent, right, to bear witness of that light. Now, I see this word sent, right? Is there anybody on the earth today that you would know of who's been sent from God? There could be. That we, There's a lot going on that we don't know about on the earth. We, none of us know why we are actually here and what led to the events of us being here. And we don't know everybody on the earth, the body of Christ. Well, we're not connected yet, are we? We're not connected yet. We are. Some of us are, but... There's a whole heap of the members of the body of Christ that we don't know about yet. So there could be some who know that they've been sent. But just in my testimony, my walk on the earth, my witness in the earth, I'm being led to think that nobody would know that they've been sent. But John the Baptist, he was sent from God. Now, this just reminds me of Isaiah 18, where we read about the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, right? And Isaiah is saying, woe, 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 woe to that land, that land that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters. So this is Moses, right? So Moses has been sent by the land that's shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Moses is one of these ambassadors that has been sent, right? He's been sent. So I look now at John 1 and I think, okay, so John the Baptist, Elijah, he's been sent from God. He's been sent from a place, from God. And I look at Isaiah 18 now and I really start to wonder whether this is the place that's woeing. Isaiah is saying, woeing to that place that's shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that sendeth ambassadors, one of those ambassadors being Moses, right? We read this in Exodus 2. Go ye swift messengers, same Hebrew word, same Hebrew word as angels, right? Same Hebrew word as angels. And in John 1, we've got John the Baptist, who the Lord Jesus Christ describes in Matthew 11 as being a messenger, same Hebrew word as angel. John 1 is telling us that he was a man sent from God whose name was John. So he's being sent from God. And in Isaiah 18, we've got ambassadors such as Moses who are being sent by this land. So is this land where Isaiah is saying woe to is this the land that's sending people? Clearly, it's it's sending Moses. But is this, is this the same land that's sending Elijah, John the Baptist? Because he was sent from God, right? So if he's sent from God, where was he? We know Elijah was in the celestial wilderness. We read that in 2 Kings 2, and he's making the star course for the Lord Jesus Christ in Isaiah 43. And the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in Matthew 17 that... John the Baptist is Elijah. So it has God sent 
Elijah, John the Baptist, from the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Now, back in John 1 and verse 23, we read the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah 40, verse 3, concerning the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Elijah, John the Baptist. But in verse 19, and this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests, sent, right? When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem, is this? The celestial Jerusalem that's, that's above and is free and it's the mother of us all? Or is this a Jerusalem on the earth? But the Jews sent priests and Levites. Now remember in Malachi 2 that the priests and Levites are the messengers, same Hebrew word as angels of the Lord of the celestial bodies. H6635 of the celestial bodies. So the priests and the Levites are messengers, same Hebrew word as angels, of the Lord of the celestial bodies, and the Jews have sent these messengers from Jerusalem to ask after John the Baptist, Elijah, who was the voice of him crying in the wilderness, that it seems to me was in heaven that we read about, in Second Kings 2, and bearing in mind that the Lord Jesus Christ has already told us in Matthew 17 that he was talking about John the Baptist being Elijah. So bearing this in mind as we, as we go through this story. So they ask him straight up, the messengers, same Greek word as angels, the priests and the Levites, same Greek word, same Hebrew word. It's the same in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Angels and messengers are the same word and the priests and the Levites are the messengers of the Lord of the celestial bodies and the Jews have sent them. So it, it completely makes sense. Sent the priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? And he confessed. So John the Baptist said, and he didn't deny it, and he confessed. He said, no, I am not the Christ. So they ask him straight up, what then? Art thou Elijah? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. So what gives, right? Because when we come back into Matthew 17, we've got the Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling the disciples straight up that Elijah's already come and the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. But when we come into John 1, we've got John the Baptist. Well, he's saying... He's saying that he's not. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. So we've got, uh, we've got John the Baptist denying that he's Elijah, we've got the Lord Jesus Christ saying, well, he is Elijah. And I just wonder here, because here we've got, this is the only, and this is why I bring this up, because this is the only recount of the story where it's actually John the Baptist saying he is the voice crying in the wilderness, where apart from Matthew 11, where the Lord Jesus Christ speaks himself of the prophecy in Isaiah 40 and verse 3, in Matthew 3 and in Mark 1 and in Luke 3, it's the author recounting the prophecy. But in John, it's very different, where John the Baptist is actually saying these things of himself. But there's two things here. So as I've been saying in this video, who are these people? Just who are these Israelites, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament? Because we've got John the Baptist here. He knows he's not Elijah. So he says, no. So as far as he knows, that's he's talking... Because I wouldn't have thought John the Baptist is a liar, so he saying no. But he knows, this man John the Baptist knows, 
knows that he is a figure from the Old Testament. He is what's spoken about in Isaiah 40 and verse 3. How does he know? He's been sent, right? He's been sent from God. And he's saying that he's not Elijah, but the Lord Jesus Christ is saying he is Elijah. And the only time the stories are different in that it's, it's John the Baptist directly saying that he is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. It's the only time it's different. And the other three accounts, well, all the other scriptures are telling me, and the Lord Jesus Christ is saying that John the Baptist is Elijah. So how does he know that he is the voice of one crying in the wilderness? And is that possible today? Can there possibly be anybody on the earth today who can go, that's me. I'm what, I'm what the scriptures were saying in Isaiah 40 verse 3. It is me. I am that person. So you look at all of these other figures in the Bible. Is there any way anyone on the earth today can just go, that's me. That's, that's who I am. And this man was sent by God. So this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. Who are these people? And now we've got this man, John the Baptist. He's just a guy, right? He's just a guy walking the earth who came before the Lord Jesus Christ. But he knows. He knows exactly who he was. He gets it dead right. They ask him. So these, these messengers, the Jews sent, the priests, the Levites, they're of the view. They think they can. he can just answer them. So they're just assuming that he knows. Otherwise, they wouldn't ask. I mean, it's nonsensical just to go and ask someone that you don't even think he's going to be able to answer. He wouldn't do it today. Is there anybody on the earth today you're going to go and just ask? Who are you in the Bible? Are you a prophecy in the Bible? Are you someone? Just, just tell us straight up, mate, who you are. It's... It's different. This is what I'm trying to say is that it's it's different. There's a marked difference that I'm seeing between the Old Testament to the New and there's a marked difference between the New Testament and today. Like in Acts, I think it's 12, might be 14. Simon Peter's got his angel and Rhoda is constantly affirming to them inside, no, it's Peter. And they're going, no, no, Rhoda, you're mad. It is his angel angel we've got all sorts of things going on in the new testament that don't go on today like does anyone on the earth today know that they've got an angel there's there's just there's, there's a difference here so who are these people who 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 are these people and how does john the baptist know that he is the one voice crying in the wilderness and what makes him think that he's not Elijah when the Lord Jesus Christ is saying that he is? There's more to this. There's absolutely more to this. But in any case, let's get back. Let's get back to Matthew 17. So Matthew 17 is the scriptures where the Lord Jesus Christ is telling the disciples that John the Baptist is Elijah and he's already come. Now in verse 2, we read that the Lord Jesus Christ was transfigured before them. Now, that word transfigured is very interesting indeed. G3339. And it means transfigure, transform, and to change. To change into another form. To transform, to transfigure. Christ's appearance was changed when he was resplendent with divine brightness on the mount of transfiguration. Right. So the Lord Jesus Christ has taken on a completely different form. So this is telling me that... I would have thought that means that the Lord Jesus Christ is no longer in the form of a man. He's now he's now in the form of something else, something completely different. And we see it four times in the scriptures. The first time in the scripture we're sharing now in Matthew 17, and then the same story, it's retold in, in the book of Mark. And then and then we read in Romans 12 and in 2 Corinthians 3 and, and in, in Romans 12 and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed, right? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove 
what is that good and acceptable and perfect. Oh, here's this word perfect again, will of God. Now in the in the Greek lexicon we get a bit of an explanation for Romans 2.12, 12 2, sorry, use of the change of moral character for the better. So this this is the new creature for me. This is the born again new creature that we're we're transformed. We're transfigured, right? So the Lord Jesus Christ, he's transfigured. He's been transfigured and his appearance was changed and was resplendent with divine brightness on the mount of transfiguration. So there's a mount, right? There's a mount of transfiguration, but he was changed. So his appearance was changed from whatever he whatever form he was in, the form of a man, right? And was resplendent with divine brightness on the mount of transfiguration. So he's in a completely different form. Now, has that happened to us? Did that happen to the Romans? Did that hurt happen to the Corinthians? Are we are we now are the body of Christ now being transfigured to, to I, I just don't to, to me Jesus has, has gone a, a step further. He's gone from the from the image of a man into the it seems to be a physical thing because he's changed into another form to transform. To transfigure, it could just be spiritual. I'm not sure, but just these tabernacles I'm about to share leads me to think that it's potentially. It could even be both. But in we read it as well in in Second Corinthians three. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So who are these people, right? Who are these people? Because the Corinthians, Paul is telling the Corinthians that they are changed into the same image, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it seems that they've been changed into this image, into this image that the Lord Jesus Christ has been transfigured into. So who are these people? This is what I say. There's, it's, it's just, there's just differences to the New Testament to what's going on today. And in the Greek lexicon, we get we are transformed into the same image to consummate excellence that shines in Christ, reproduce the same, reproduce the same image. So this this for me goes to a spiritual thing. This for me goes as well as Romans twelve. So it, it, it could mean that what we're reading in Matthew seventeen, they just saw a spiritual change come over him. But if that's the case, before he was transfigured, that means he wasn't. The Lord Jesus Christ wasn't in this spiritual state. So whether something happened to him on that day or whether he, I don't know, he was he was baptised in Matthew 3, wasn't he? So for me, it goes deeper. I think it goes deeper. I'm being absolutely led to think it goes deeper and it's potentially a physical, it's potentially a physical transformation. Now, back in Matthew 17, where the Lord Jesus Christ has been transfigured before Peter, James, and John, we've got Moses and Elijah, right? So it's Moses and Elijah who appeared unto him. Now, have Moses and Elijah taken on this same form? Have they been transfigured as well? Because Moses is dead. Elijah, he was taken up to heaven in 2 Kings 2, but John the Baptist was beheaded before this by Herod. So if Elijah's dead, Moses is dead, the Lord Jesus Christ is still alive, he hasn't been crucified yet, and he's been transfigured before them, and we've got two dead people appearing with the Lord Jesus Christ on the mount, on the mount of transfiguration, Moses, Moses and Elijah being those two people. But in any case, when these things happen, Simon Peter said unto Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here if thou wilt let us make here three tabernacles, right? One for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. So what's a tabernacle? What is a tabernacle? Because it's Simon Peter, it's Simon Peter's reaction when he sees these things to say to the Lord Jesus Christ, let us make three tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So what's a tabernacle? Oh, you won't 
Sun has come, you've been left behind.